Hi, my name is Ethan. I am an educator for the Artesian Alliance, which is Chiha Park and Zoo, the Flint River Aquarium, and the Theronatiska Heritage Center. And today I'm actually coming to you from one of our office rooms in the Flint River Aquarium. Um, and I am going to be talking to you about geologic time um, and exactly what that means here. Uh, so I am going to share my screen with you here. Um, we've got, and I've appropriately named it for the longest time, uh, geologic time that is, because geologic time is actually um, very old. <laughs> uh, whenever I talk about geologic history or geologic time, um, or anytime I use history or time for the rest of this lecture, I'm not talking about years and months and days and weeks. I'm talking about thousands, millions, and billions of years. Huge, broad times, um, huge frames of time. Um, not whenever you pick up a history book, you expect it to have dates, right? Well, this isn't exactly the same kind of dates. This is more ranges of dates. So like the dinosaurs went extinct about 67 million years ago, but we don't know what day the dinosaurs went extinct. Most of them didn't go extinct in a single day. They went extinct over the course of thousands of years, hundreds of years. So it's very hard to tell um, exactly when specifically something happened. So instead we measure it more as sort of like, it happened generally at this time and it happened generally at this time. So they're a lot broader of dates. They're a lot, um, they're usually not specific to even a few years. They're usually more like this happened over the course of several thousand years here several million years ago. Um, and actually, so what you have on over here on the right side of the screen is actually a very interesting way to talk about geologic time. They have um, it sort of set up like a big circling river, like a big corkscrew, just going around and around and around and around. Um, so this is one way that they can show it off. And they're showing off fossils and stuff because actually the way that we measure geologic time is based off of what was alive at any given point or what was happening on the earth at that time. So the earth, let's move on to talking about the earth. Um, so like, how do we know how old something is in geologic time? How do we know? Um, it's, it's kind of difficult to tell, like, how do we know that say at this time right here, there were um, plesiosaurs roaming the water and leopleurodons, and, and how do we know that right here has trilobites and things like that, other things that you can see in here. And this place has clams, and we see that there are some fish here. And how do we know what lived at what time? Um, there's a couple different ways. Um, this is probably one of the parts that most people get the most tripped up about whenever we're discussing geology is exactly how we can figure things out. Like, how do we know that the dinosaurs went extinct 67 to 65 million years ago? How do we know that um, the earth is 4.54 billion years old? How do we know that? It's, it seems like such a, a very specific number to know. And there are three big ways that we know. Um, there's what's known as the law of superposition, which has a fancy title, but it's a very, very simple thing to understand. The, I, and then there's ways that we date rocks. We figure out how old they are. Um, and we can do it using relative dating or absolute dating. So let's first talk about the law of superposition. So the law of superposition states that for any rock formation, the oldest rocks are usually going to be at the bottom. And um, if they're not, it means that something happened. So they're usually rocks will get laid down in bands and rows. You've probably seen this before. Um, here in um, Albany, Georgia, you can actually see it. If you're going down along the Flint River, you can see the layers of soil that got deposited and how they're all banded near the sides. Um, you can see it in mountains um, and in canyons, like the Grand Canyon is a great example. You can see several different layers on the Grand Canyon. You can even see it in places like Providence Canyon in Georgia here. Um, so the oldest rocks are going to be at the bottom. And the reason why the oldest rocks are going to be at the bottom, and I know it sounds really obvious, 
but the oldest rocks are at the bottom and because they got laid down first and then newer rocks got laid down and then newer rocks got laid down and newer rocks got laid down and newer rocks got laid down until you've got all of these layers um, with the youngest rocks and soil and dirt and stuff all the way at the top and the oldest stuff at the bottom. All of this makes sense so far. Um, so how do we know that? Um, for a while, we, we didn't really necessarily know that. We just made a lot of observations and uh, figured out that in general, it seemed like the older rocks were near the bottom and the youngest rocks were near the top. Um, so another way that we determine the age of rocks is by what's known as relative dating. So after we know that the oldest rocks are gonna be at the bottom and the youngest rocks are gonna be at the top, now we can look at what's in the rocks. So things like fossils, for instance, all over the place, there are fossils. And so say a very specific fossil is found only in this chunk of rock down here, and it's not found anywhere above or anywhere below. It's just right there in the middle. Then we know that this specific rock, um, if we say find, we know that um, these fossils that live up here are gonna be newer than the fossils down here because of that first law of superposition, right? And if we say find this specific fossil that only exists at this, in this range here, if we find it in a different rock formation, then we know that those two are probably gonna be about the same age. So we can compare and say, hey, this fossil only existed at this time, which means that anywhere we find that fossil, the rock has to be about as old. Does that make sense? It makes, it, it's kind of a very intuitive thing, right? Um, so this image here um, does a really good job of it. You've got fossil assemblage A, B, and C here. The ones that exist um, at A, you can find fossils around this time on the whole rock formation. Um, and then you see on B, you can find some of these around this time. And then C, you can find some of these around here. And some of them you can find all throughout. But these index fossils, the ones that only exist at certain time frames. So like, if I were to find a rock and it has a crustacean on it, like this guy, this crab, then I know that that rock is younger than the rock nearby that I found with this specific kind of shell in it. It's going to be younger. And so I know it's younger. So relative dating doesn't do specific ages. It doesn't tell you how old something is. It just tells you how old things are when compared to one another. So um, like if I find this crab, I know that it's going to be older than a rock that I find that has this trilobite down here. Um, now let's talk about absolute dating. So absolute dating, as the name suggests, tells you a specific time. It's not necessarily a, a very specific time. So it could be sort of a range of times, but it's, it's much more specific than relative dating. Whereas relative dating, you have to compare it to other things and say, is it older? Is it younger? What's going on here? Um, absolute dating says it's about this old or it's about this old. Um, and the way that we do absolute data, we do a couple different things. Um, we determine the age of a rock or a fossil, and then we can absolutely date things. Um, we can find their, their finite times um, with very specific uh, accuracies. So um, a lot of people have heard the term carbon dating. Carbon dating is, um, whenever you use um, what's known as carbon-14. So this is where chemistry starts to play in a little bit. It gets a little complicated here, but don't worry, I'm gonna try to simplify it for you. There's a lot of different elements out there and elements um, can be radioactive, which means that they are slowly shooting out um, uh, radioactive energy and they're slowly turning into other chemicals. So like for instance, carbon-14, slowly turns into carbon 12, which is uh, the more stable carbon. So carbon 14 doesn't like to be carbon 14. It wants to be carbon 12. So kind of like how after uh, the winter time, 
everybody goes to the gym. Carbon-14 is going to go to the gym. It's going to lose a couple um, nuclei, nuclei. It's going to lose a couple neutrons, and it's going to become carbon-12. So what we can do is, in, say, a fossil that's made out of carbon, we can determine how much carbon-14 there is in it and sort of work backwards um, to figure out how old this fossil is. Um, now, this is used for very young things, and young is very relative. Young is 60,000 years in this case, which is very young for geologic time, but obviously it's very old. 60,000 is a very old number, but 60,000 years ago is basically yesterday in geologic time. So you can use carbon-14 radio radiometric dating for very short periods of time. There are other um, techniques that you can use for much longer periods of time. So like for instance, potassium argon. Um, so potassium turns into argon. It slowly wants to become argon. And so it slowly turns into argon over the time, over time. And we can look at it and weigh it and figure out how much potassium uh, a rock has and how much argon it has and sort of work backwards to figure out how old it has to be. Um, other examples that we use pretty regularly are uranium-238, um, which is actually the same one that um, the same isotope that our um, uh, the original um, atom bombs were made out of uranium 238 and uranium 235 right here. These guys both um, helped make our atom bombs. That's actually because we discovered how to do absolute dating whenever we were building um, the atom bomb during the Manhattan Project. Um, so. Uh, kind of a weird silver lining and come out of such a destructive thing like the atomic bomb is that now we know how to date rocks pretty well. Um, so uh, uranium-238, we can measure amounts of that if it's present to figure out um, how old something is to an accuracy of about 4.5 billion years, which is pretty good. Um, you can measure something out to about 713 million years with uranium-235. And we also use what's known as thorium-232. And that one's accurate pretty much for as long as we're going to need it to be accurate. Accurate to about 13.9 billion years, which is far older than the Earth. And so if we find thorium, we can pretty much figure out exactly how much it is. And plutonium is good for about 2.4 million years. So. Um, we use different elements um, to, to sort of work backwards using math um, to figure out how old something is um, using what's known as radiometric dating. And we actually, it's a lot like um, we use whatever element is available to us. Um, so sometimes a uh, rock might have a lot of thorium, but no uranium. So we'd have to use thorium. But another thing that we use it for is it's like if you are trying to measure something. If you're trying to measure something and it's only a few inches long, you probably want to use a ruler, right? Um, you probably wouldn't use a huge yardstick to try to measure something that's only an inch. Um, and you definitely wouldn't want to use this 12 inch ruler to measure out 15 yards, right? That would be that would be a lot of work. You'd have to really work very hard and you wouldn't be as accurate whenever you were done. Um, so we kind of use different types of, uh, of elements, different radiometric dating practices to try to figure out um, uh, different as different tools to figure out how old something is. So sometimes we might need, it might be very old and we might need to measure it back a whole lot. Other times we might be trying to find out how old the fossil is inside of the rock. So we would need to use something a little bit younger. Um, and ultimately, um, there's uh, a lot of problems. There's a lot of problems um, with absolute dating because at the end of the day, we don't always know how old something is and we can't always find these isotopes and things to measure to sort of work backwards and figure out how old something is. We can't do it all the time. So sometimes it gets very, very difficult. So before we were able to use radiometric dating, how did we know how old the Earth was? Um, kind of, uh, I know there's a lot of ideas out there for how old the Earth is, 
Um, and those ideas um, haven't always existed. In fact, um, uh, in the mid 1600s, the Catholic Church declared that Earth had to have been um, at least 10,000 years old, if not more. Um, uh, they didn't have any math or science. They just said, man, this has to be very old. Um, and people generally everywhere, scientists, scholars, priests, uh, just about everyone agreed that the earth is really old, but they just didn't know exactly how old. Um, and in 1788, a man named James Hutton, who was a, a very important geologist, um, he said that the earth had to be quote unquote, infinitely old. Um, he believed that the earth was so ancient, we would never be able to know how old it was because it wouldn't matter. It was so old. Um, and he thought it was so old because he was looking at things like canyons and seeing how many layers of rock. And he's like, holy cow, this has to be incredibly old. And then we had a, a slight breakthrough in the 1800s. Um, we were looking at the ocean salt level. And you can actually track how salty the ocean gets. And so we sort of work backwards um, saying, well, if the ocean's salty at this time and it's salt and it's a different level of saltiness at this time, then we can sort of work backwards as if it was on a line um, and figure out how much, how long ago it had to have been before the ocean um, formed. And we know, and we figured out that due to the salt level of the ocean, we knew that it was at least 400 million years old. And we knew this all the way back in the 1800s. We were able to tell that the earth had to be at least 400 million years old. Um, in the early 1900s, uh, we were starting to look at stars and we figured out based off of um, the heat being given off by the sun, we figured out that the sun was 4.6 billion years old. Um, and the way that we figured that out is, uh, if the sun is giving off a certain heat right now, um, and it's made up of this amount of chemicals, we were able to tell what the sun was made out of using what's known as chromatography. We were able to tell what the sun was made out of and how much heat it was giving off. And we were able to sort of work backwards, just like we've done with everything here, um, and use some math to figure out that the sun has to be 4.6 billion years old. Um, so we knew that the earth was somewhere between 400 million and 4.6 billion years old, but we didn't know exactly when. Um, so in the 1940s, as I mentioned before, as atomic um, study became a thing, as we started to understand how atoms work and how radiation work, we were able to figure out that we could date rocks based off of the amount of radiation um, that we see. Um, but there are already some challenges to radiometric dating. So it only works on very specific rocks. You can only measure rocks that have things that you're capable of measuring. What if a rock doesn't have uranium or cesium or thorium or carbon even? What if it doesn't have any of those things? How are you going to be able to tell um, how old a rock is? If the rock has been out in weather, that could have changed it if the rock has metamorphosized, so um, turned into a different kind of rock that also changed it. We also just didn't know everything that we should have about half-lives and radiation yet. We were still figuring it out. It was a very, very new, fresh science. So we weren't able to reach more than about 1 billion years. So we knew that the earth was at least 1 billion years old at this point and no older than 4.6 billion years but we still didn't have a very good range of how old the earth was. And it wasn't until, um, well, I've got this big picture of the moon for a very good reason, because it wasn't until we actually went to the moon that we figured out how old the earth was. We used the moon to figure out how old the earth was, which I think is wild. We couldn't figure it out on our own. We had to go to a different celestial body to figure out how old we are. So it is generally understood that the moon came from the earth. Something had to have happened. It's maybe something really big collided with the Earth, and a big old chunk of the Earth got shot off and ended up on the Moon. Even if that isn't true, and we're we we know that that is true, we just aren't sure exactly how it happened. 
Um, but even if it wasn't true, the moon has to be at least as old as the earth, right? It can't be any older than the earth or at most as old as the earth. It can't be any older than the earth because it's orbiting the earth. Just like how the earth can't be any older than the sun because it's orbiting the sun. It didn't exist before the other one. So the moon is younger than the earth and the earth is younger than the sun. So if we know the age of the moon and we know the age of the sun, we know that the earth is somewhere in between those two. So whenever um, on July 20th, 1968, sorry, 1969, July 20th, 1969, that's a typo. Um, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins landed on the moon. And one of the things that they did whenever they were on the moon was collect moon rocks. These moon rocks uh, made their way back to Earth. And because the moon has no atmosphere, these rocks have been virtually untouched, um, which makes them excellent for radiometric dating. It, has, it doesn't have any of the weathering issues. It doesn't have any of the weird metamorphosis issues. Um, they are pretty much pristine rocks. So they measured them and they determined that these rocks um, were 4.51 billion years old, which means that the Earth, therefore, has to be at least 4.51 billion years old and at most 4.6 billion years old. So that is a much better number. Now we know um, about the age of the Earth. So then we found some more rocks um, in places like Australia, and we were able to better age our earth and we've actually found rocks since then that are in the 4.54 billion year old billion year old range so we know that our rocks are actually somewhere in this range of 4.5 to 4.6 billion years old um, so that's actually how we figured it out we had to go all the way to the moon to figure out how old the earth um, so now how do we know how old different fossils are? Well, we use a combination of absolute dating where we find good examples of rocks that are as old, that are that old, and we date them. And now we know that this rock is that old and it has this specific fossil in it. And this fossil only exists in, it only exists in this place at this time, which means that anytime we find this fossil, we now know that it is that old. So we had all of these relative dates where we knew that something was older than this thing, which is older than this thing, which is older than this thing. Um, and now we have a reference point somewhere. And using that reference point, kind of like if you were working out, you ever done like those connect the dots puzzles? Kind of like how if you know where one of the dots is and you know where the other dot is in relation, you can draw an entire shape. And so that's how we figured out um, all of our... Uh, the history of all of our rocks and how old they were and how old the earth was when different things happened. Um, and nowadays we can look at a rock and um, we sort of do a little sleuthing, figure out what fossils are found in the rock or if the rock was part of a larger formation, we can usually tell how old it was based off of how old the formation was. And we can put together these jigsaw puzzles until we have a complete image of our earth. Um, so now let's talk about geologic time, because I'm going to walk you guys through um, a basic overview of how our Earth has looked over the years. Um, geologic time is split up in eons, which are these huge spans. We have the Archean eon, the um, Proterozoic eon, and then we have um, the current eon that we are in now. Um, the Archean and the Proterozoic is usually combined into what's known as the Precambrian. And that's because this time right here is called the Cambrian. So everything before the Cambrian is called the Precambrian. Um, after eons are eras, which are what you see here, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. We're going to talk about those here and what that means. And then you have different periods, which is what you see here. And some of these names might pop out at you, like, for instance, Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Those are the uh, ages of the dinosaurs. These are the three ages that dinosaurs existed in, um, all within the Mesozoic era, which is in the current eon. Um, and then after um, periods, you get even more specific ones called epochs and even more specific ones called ages, but we're not gonna worry too much about, about that. Um, for now, um, all you need to know is that um, there are different geologic periods and different eras and ages, and that's how we split things up. Um, and each one is defined by what was alive inside of it. 
in that time frame. So some creatures were only alive at very specific times. And that is how we know um, that the earth looked very distinct in that specific time frame. Um, so I didn't like that geologic timeline all that much because it doesn't give you a good sense of scale. So instead I decided to record one and we're gonna watch it all through at once here. And then I might watch it again and stop it at different points to talk about it a bit. So we're gonna start all the way back at 4.6 billion years ago um, or 4,600 million years ago as I'm about to um, put it. Um, so 4.6 billion years ago, the earth forms. And then not long after you start to see oceans form on the surface. A little bit after that, the crust, the, the crust that covers the planet and the core started to form. And then about 3.85 billion years ago, we start to see our first signs of life, um, which are just these tiny little bacteria floating around, all of these extremely small, very basic um, creatures floating around um, in, the, in, the, um, in the oceans. Um, no atmosphere yet, none of that. It's just water on rock at this point. And you see that there's a very long period of time um, where it seems like nothing happened, but a lot was happening. We just don't know a whole lot about it. Um, these small little creatures are floating around in the water. Um, our atmosphere is starting to form, but this is a whole lot of walking before we get our atmosphere actually forming. Only 1.5 billion years ago. We just covered 3 billion years of time where there was no atmosphere on the earth. Nothing, no atmosphere. There was no air above our heads. It was just water and rock. But finally, we start to get some, some oxygen in our atmosphere. And so not too long after, there we are, about 800 million years ago, we start to see our first um, multicellular animals. So instead of just these tiny little bacteria floating around, we start to see um, jellyfish and sea sponges and very basic things like that start to form. And uh, not, not much longer after it, we get what's known as the Paleozoic era. Um, this is what's known as the Cambrian explosion because you'll see here, the first vertebrates appear. So what happened was, it's kind of crazy. Um, all at once, suddenly, we get a ton of fossils right at the, at the beginning of the Cambrian, at the beginning of the Paleozoic, we see tons of fossils start to form. Um, and all of these fossils, are because it's almost like a tree branching out. You have the, this life, this life, this life that was figuring it out. And then suddenly all of the right conditions were met and you start, were met and you start to see all of these animals start to appear, including the first vertebrates, which are animals with a backbone. So we are an example of a vertebrate. Our earliest, earliest ancestors started to appear about 530 million years ago. And then, it isn't much longer before we start to see plants start to come up on the land. So I mentioned that our atmosphere was starting to form um, and our atmosphere is formed at this point, but animals haven't quite figured out how to get on land yet, but plants have and plants are starting to get up on the land. Um, also giant bugs start to get onto land, um, huge insects, like there's giant millipedes at this point and not just like this big millipedes, I mean millipedes large enough that you could ride them. They're huge millipedes um, starting to form. And not long after you start to see um, these fish that they're not quite fish anymore, that have these um, fins down on the bottom of their body, they're starting to sort of flop up onto land. Um, and they slowly turn into what's known as amphibians, um, which we still have today. Um, so now, 250 million years ago, you get the Mesozoic era, and the Mesozoic era is famous for having dinosaurs in it. So the first dinosaurs appear not long after the Mesozoic era begins, and in just that tiny little short period of time, that's the only time dinosaurs existed. They go extinct about 66 million years ago. So just in that, that tiny little frame, um, dinosaurs existed, thrived, and then immediately went extinct. And then not long after that, you get the first humans appearing about 300,000 years ago.
and uh, humans make their first real appearance about 300,000 years ago. Um, ancestors to humans have existed for about 2.5 million years, like recognizable ancestors to humans, but humans themselves have only really lived on this planet. Homo sapiens sapiens have only really existed on this planet for about 300,000. Um, and it's so small, in fact, that I can't even really separate it from the modern day. And so now, as a sort of a frame, this is how long the timeline is. Oops. Let's see if we can fast forward it all the way to the end here. Keep it paused. So as you can see, this rope is actually extending all the way to that building over there. That's 46 yards, which is about half of a, half of a football field. And every single centimeter, um, every single centimeter in that, um, that thing was a million years. Every single centimeter that we're crossing was one million years. Um, so if we were to, if every single million years of this planet were just one centimeter, um, it would cover half a football field, our entire timeline, and humans would only appear in the last centimeter, like less than a centimeter, three millimeters of um, of time is is just that. And this is this is just another way to show it here. Um, so as you can see, there's a whole lot of stuff, and then this was whenever life began, uh, and this was whenever vertebrates started to appear, and around here was when the dinosaurs existed and then they went extinct and then all the way up here in the Holocene humans came about. So geologic time is really ancient is what I'm trying to say. It's very, very old and it is a whole lot of stuff. Um, and so um, that is kind of why it can be uh, so hard to explain um, to people is because it, it's just hard to wrap your head around the sheer scale of it. So Anyways, um, to wrap up, uh, we use relative dating to figure out the ages of things compared to one another. And we use absolute dating, which is whenever we measure how much radioactivity rocks have to figure out how old things are. We figured out how old our Earth was um, by finding uh, a couple rocks on Earth and a whole bunch of rocks on the moon to sort of age them and figure out a range for how old our planet is. Um, and uh, all of this together helps us to figure out in a couple just basic rules, such as older rocks are found at the bottom and younger rocks are found at the top. All of these together help geologists figure out how old um, things are and exactly what the earth looked like at any given time. Um, so that is my whole lesson here. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you next time. Bye.